back in the top six. Four more goals, back-to-back wins for the first time since September. The Wagner Lucian, as I'm dubbing it, is well and truly underway. Hello, friends. Welcome to the latest edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. Here to reflect on what was a glorious day in the Midlands for the Canaries, a 4-2 win over Coventry City at the CBS Arena. I'm Connor Southwell, joined by our strike partnership of Paddy Davitt and Samuel Seaman to uh, pick the bones out of and dissect all the key talking points surrounding Norwich City and that win on Saturday. Paddy, it would probably be remiss of me not to come to you first because it was somewhat of a homecoming for you. I think you uh, you labelled it as the Davitt Derby, which is a, a nice slogan to, to attribute to it. I turned to you, uh, I think, just after Norwich City has scored their third goal. And I must admit, your face wasn't particularly happy at, at, at that moment in time. Um, how did you find the afternoon and, uh, and probably the, the game more, more widely? Because I know you had some family members in the home end as well. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, it was quite enjoyable, apart from the fact that from a Coventry fan perspective, that watching your team get beat. But uh, yeah, both my sisters were there. My nephew was there, who's... Um, budding striker so I, I actually and bizarrely the family stand there was to the left of where we were situated so I, I actually was able to go and essentially give him a, a hug at half time and told I basically told him because Norwich were going to be attacking that in second half as a striker you just got to watch Timu Puki's movement because that's how good that player is at that level so I don't think he was that minded to hear that information given he was there in his Coventry branded gear but uh, he's got if he's a cough fan as I am he's got to get used to disappointment early so even at seven years of age you, you need to realise that it's not going to be all champagne and Premier League hopefully because uh, there is a Norwich link all joking aside uh, with Doug King who's just gone in there as their new owner um, pledging to get him to the Premier League he's a Norwich fan by birth born, born and raised in Lowestoft no less but uh, now was successful businessman over in Warwickshire he was there he was doing some media, wasn't he, before the game. Um, and overall, it was quite enjoyable. I mean, first time we've been back there in, I think, 11 years or so because of the various nomadic moves they've had, you know, to Northampton and St. Andrews more recently. But to go back there from an Norwich perspective, perform as they did, uh, 3,000 witnessing it as well. Um, no, I actually, bizarrely, really enjoyed it. Probably the most enjoyable game I've, I've covered this season for, for all those reasons. But ultimately, uh, we were there with our Norwich hats on. And um, yeah, that first half, I, I think I, I don't think it was probably when the third one went in, that it was more from a Coventry point of view. It was more what on earth's going on here because it was complete carnage in that first half. And then it, from then, of course, then we had two goals in six minutes as Cov hit back. And so... Um, you know that was mad. That was a mad. That was a mad forty-five. Well, I mean, the first, you could say the mad, a mad twenty-six minutes because it did actually, thankfully, to calm down a bit for the rest of the second half. But that first twenty-six seven minutes, that's have we had a more mad championship slice of action this season involving Norwich? I can't recall it, but uh, thankfully uh, Norwich fell the right side of it and did so with a very controlled performance thereafter. So, as you say. Uh, Wagner Lucian, uh, whatever you want to call, whatever label you want to stick on it, uh, something's happening, something's bobbling, and um, let's cling on, fans, media, because uh, it's going at a very huge pace. And um, two two championship games from what we had before is remarkable. The scale of the transformation, the speed of it, um, and ultimately those three thousand fans will go home yesterday and did do, I'm sure, with a very warm glow inside, thinking something special might be happening here. And, um, you know, if it continues on in this vein, it's going to be some ride, however it ends this season. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's it's nice of them to manage only half an hour of chaos, given we do a full hour every week. So uh, it's nice of them to experience half of, uh, of, what we, of we of what we put ourselves every week and the output that we put into producing that. Um, Sam, I mean, let, let's let's kind of start then at the beginning. I'm going to come back to Kov, by the way, because I've got a few things to, to, um, to point at. Uh, from from our trip and from last week last week's podcast as well, but we'll talk about the football first. Um, David Wagner, Sam, first Norwich City head coach manager uh, in history, whose team has scored four or more goals in their first two league games. Park everything else for a moment, and obviously we'll get into the context that that was the madness of that first half. I mean, that's some going, isn't it? Two, well, two games, two league games at least, six points, eight goals, two conceded. It's not bad. Yeah, and this with 
one of the most sterile Norwich City sides I think any of us have seen in the weeks prior to his appointment. And I think that sums up what David Wagner's all about, really. He came in, promised attacking football, exciting football, and he's already started to deliver on those promises. Um, I think it's the sort of game that, I said this after the Preston game, so perhaps I'll be proven wrong, but it's probably not the sort of thing we, we want to get used to because I can already see myself being bored with a, a 2-1 Norwich win um, next week or, you know, sort of three goals and another point. And yeah, I think it sets a, a really good precedent. It it certainly gives Wagner credit in the bank and probably gets people behind the project that he's got he's got going at Carrow Road because he's come in, he's promised attacking football and he's promised that exciting football. Um, and it's quite easy to do that. You know, Daniel Farker came in and promised beautiful football and it took a year of patience and um, probably tense atmosphere at Carrow Road and impatience from from outside the, the Norfolk bubble and, and having to deal with that for them to actually reach that style of play. So for Wagner to come in, yes, he's got a very different scenario with the squad. It's, it's a very capable team for, for this league. But to come in and be able to deliver on what he's promised already, uh, probably with the two most entertaining Norwich performances of the season in his opening two games, I think has done has, has probably done wonders for the football club. We know how important a good start was for Wagner and we spoke about that when he arrived. The, the fans, as much as they were pleased, I think, with Dean Smith leaving the club and the idea of a fresh start, there was still a lot of irritation and there are still people at the club who have a lot to answer for. So you did feel, especially given he's so aligned to Stuart Webber, who's come in for a lot of criticism, if, if that instant... Um, momentum boost and those signs of what he's trying to do weren't there early then it, it wouldn't have taken long for perhaps that, that the the messaging around that appointment and the perception of it to, to go south so I think the fact that they've scored four goals in both of his first two league games um, really does help cement that what he was saying wasn't just rhetoric, it wasn't just telling the fans what they wanted to hear and him sort of repeating what he heard perhaps in his interviews and in, in his discussions with Stuart Webber come into the game, um, what he promised when he came in was exactly what he's trying to do. And with these players performing like they have um, in the last two games, it's no surprise really, because you look at the quality they've got, um, Kieran Dowell, Tamer Pukki, um, even the likes of Ernel Hernandez, who I thought was really good um, yesterday. They've all pr- proven themselves at championship level and they've all produced performances like the ones we've seen in the last two weeks before. So, it's not really any surprise. I think that the most good managers and head coaches should have been able to produce this, perhaps not four goals every time, but they should have been able to produce uh, a consistent, creative and attacking output from this squad. Uh, but the fact that Wagner's come in and done it in such um, eccentric style, I think really helps reinforce what he's about and probably helps endear him to this group of fans. Yeah, completely that. Um Paddy, I mean, for for as much as we're we're probably going to spend the, the next fifty minutes or so praising the performance, praising David Wagner, praising probably a, a handful of Norwich City players. I mean, let, let's let's discuss the the absolute chaos that was that first half. I mean, again, Norwich came absolutely racing out of the the traps, three uh, 0 up inside eighteen minutes. It was then three two, I think, by 25, 26 minutes. It was. Um, as good as perhaps the opening 18 minutes were, the following six probably showed David Wagner and probably anyone around Norwich City the work that there is still left to be done with this group of players because it was, I felt, maybe a slip back into what we had seen in terms of mentality. Uh, He spoke about a lack of coolness. I think he described it as Wild West football. They certainly didn't have the control on the game that he wanted them to see. And actually, he he spoke to you about how unhappy he was with that first half performance. That 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 I guess shows the the standards that he's setting with, with this group. But as a first half, the chaos of it, the the lack of control of it, I guess illustrates to him, illustrates to everyone else, just how far Norwich City have to improve if they want to make this into a successful promotion push in the second half of the season. Yeah, it was it was a pertinent reminder because um, you know at three 0 up on the back of what they did at Preston, you, you were thinking, well, uh, as, as a few Norwich fans subsequently did, and Sam did the, the fan reaction piece, you know, already booking hotels for Wembley and playoff finals. And, and 
it was almost like this this is ridiculously easy. I think in the bigger picture, very good that they did get a couple of um, you know bops on the nose metaphorically and just reminded them that it is essentially a new head coach coming in with a dramatically different outlook on how he wants his teams to play and the demands he's placing on his players. Um, and it's going to take substantially more than two games and a handful of training sessions to embed that um, those principles that the core demands that he's placing on the on the players. And, and yeah, as you say, it crystallised in that first half response from Coventry, but also how Norwich maybe contributed to to allowing them back into the game, a game that, that you know at three 0 up it should have been should have been over fundamentally. And I think. Yeah, you're right. We we put it to him. I put it to him. There was another report followed up, and um, he was quite open. He said he was angry at half time. That was the word he used. Conveyed that anger to the players. So uh, you can imagine, given how passionate he comes across um, in an effusive, positive manner, that if it goes the other way as well, you're in no doubt that there's a guy stood in front of you in that dressing room who's less than impressed. Um, I've actually got the quotes here, and and and, and his anger was essentially that that they let them back into the game. Um, and basically by that, what he was talking about is that they weren't good enough in possession. That was what he felt was the crux of the matter, that even at 3-0, um, you know, they they hadn't reached the standards, and just paraphrasing here, in terms of our positions on the grass, in terms of picking the right path to, to offer angles. Basically, what they did on the ball, uh, or what they didn't do on the ball, to be fair, from the middle of that first half, invited Coventry forward and Mark Robbins is a very very uh, brave coach you know he, he you know he, he stacked his team with attacking players um and they really accepted that invite and pinned uh, pin Norwich back and got the two goals in six minutes and essentially they lost control of the game that's think what what irked Wagner so much uh, we didn't control the ball we didn't control the game we were not calm enough we were not able to put enough passes together to create those moments we lost the ball too early uh, and it was wild, wild west, as you say. So, ultimately, he did make the point. While he was angry, he also, him and his coaches, um, had the clips ready, showed the players, tried to deconstruct the issues, made a change tactically, brought Yanulis off, uh, McCallum on, just to shore up that left side of Norwich. But that's where Nor uh, Coventry's two goals had come from, with with Darbo and Norton Coffey, the guy that got in on loan, I think, from Arsenal off the top of my head. Um they really did give Dimmy quite a torrid time. And Fagner's seen that, reacted to it, but also more broadly wanted the, the team as a whole to regain that composure, regain that control, play in the right areas, make better passing angles. And we saw all of that in the second half. And it and it was comfortable, that second half. Yes, Kieran Dow goal to make it 4-2 just in, afforded them a little bit more breathing space. But even at 3-2, I mean, how many saves or how much action, in fact, did Tim Krul have to do in that second half bar changing the angle of attack with the ball at his feet. I don't, I don't recall him having to do too much. And, and that was a testament to how well Wagner deconstructed it, which I think is really important because there's not just Dean Smith, but there's been quite a lot of recent Norwich coaches that's been a charge labelled that on that they can't affect the game during the game um, and, and see something happening in real time and then counteract it or they're too slow to do that. He wasn't in that instance, you know, both in terms of a tactical change, but also in terms of the what he felt was going wrong and how he could put it right with that same group of players. I thought that was really impressive coaching from him. And fundamentally, anger at half-time, um, plenty of joy at full-time. And, um, you know, it is, but it is, to, to, to bring it right back round to your point, Connor, it is a reminder that as good as it feels at the minute and, you know, four goals in two away games, you know, Dean Smith hadn't managed that in the previous 26. You know, they hadn't scored four goals a game. Wagner's done it in his first two. But yet, that was a reminder. I think that that middle part of the first half on Saturday, that there is work to do. And by no manner of means are they the finished article under this head coach. But the fact that that is the case, and he could see it happening in front of his eyes and changed it and affected a positive change, to the point where Nor Norwich were then back in control for the remainder of the game, hugely positive. And, and again, maybe just a signal that this is a head coach who is, um, you know, a very, very, very good operator and uh, already feels right. But but more evidence of that, that, that they have made a very good choice, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, I, I think 
in in if that circumstance and that game state would have came about earlier on in the season where when they had Dean Smith in the dugout, you do wonder how they would have responded to it and whether Coventry would have been able to to get themselves back in the encounter. Obviously, all hypothetical now, but given what we saw and and the block of evidence that you have, you would probably suggest that this game would have transpired completely differently. And I guess that's where we end when where we end up, Sam, because that second half performance, as Paddy alludes to, there displayed all the control, all the dominance, all the ability to change. Um, kind of the swing of momentum, I guess, that that hasn't been visible or wasn't visible, not only in that first half display where it's just pure chaos, but but also throughout this this season. That was probably as controlled a 45 minutes as we've seen from Norwich City in the in the championship this season. It wasn't just the fact that that obviously they scored the fourth goal to win the game. It, it was the nature of it, the way they starved Coventry of possession there, their extended spells of possession, which did create space and, and, and exploited what was pretty tired legs in, in the Coventry camp at that stage. And um, that was impressive in the nature that they went about. That was impressive. And as Paddy said, the way that they were able to deconstruct it, change it, um, given especially how Coventry changed their, their kind of pressing structure and they were targeting Norwich's left side to bring on Sam McCallum. All of these aspects lead you to conclude that that second half was in many ways, even though Norwich City found themselves 3-0 up after 18 minutes, probably the most impressive aspect of uh, of Saturday's win. Yeah, and it was definitely the, the aspect that Wagner was most pleased with, as, as Paddy referenced, in terms of his anger with the first half. I think <clears throat> the, perception, the, the, the perception around managers like this, the, the maybe more emotional and more charismatic managers, are such that they would probably prefer the the way that the first half unfolded and then that they might enjoy it more. I think it shows Wagner's ambition and how seriously he takes things that he's able to recognise that as 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 much as that may have been fun for fans to watch and it may have been good for neutrals to watch, that's not the style of football he sees guaranteeing promotion or at least maximising their chances of, of producing it. I think he recognises that relying on those sorts of wins isn't going to be the best way forward and that they have to actually find ways to dominate games. And what pleased me about that second half was Dean Smith would probably point at various times in the season where Norwich enjoyed a lot of possession. The opposition didn't have too many chances um, and they weren't particularly threatened. But what stood out to me was the fact that I I felt it was clear. It was... It was out of choice, you use the term starving Coventry of possession. And I think that was what it was, as opposed to sitting in front of a back line, hoping that something was going to happen. Um, it felt to me that when they went back to Tim Krul, it was because they wanted to reset and they wanted to take their time in possession. It wasn't because they didn't have a forward pass um, or they were frustrated. And then when they felt there was the opportunity to to pick their moment and to try and exploit a weakness in the final third, they went and did it and you saw that with obviously the final goal they scored when Sam McCallum burst into the box and cuts back for Kieran Dow. Uh, I think it was good to see that patience, but also I felt throughout the second half that there was a good chance Norwich were going to score another one. And that's not something I've felt quite a lot this season when they've been sat in front of a, a packed, organised, structured championship defence. There's been so many times when I'm sure the majority of the fans in the stadium have, have thought, have just wondered where on earth the chance is going to come from. Um, but their movement looked so much better when they chose to to create those patterns. Um, I think the quality of the players has got better since they've had the confidence provided by Wagner's arrival and just the choices that they had to control the game and move the game in the ways that they wanted was, was a level of control, as you spoke about, that we haven't seen um, so far this season. So for me, in terms of applicability to the rest of their championship games that second half was far more encouraging than what we saw in the first half as much as I loved watching that first half um, I'm not sure I loved having to keep up with it from a reporting point of view for quite as much but as much as I loved watching that first half I think for Norwich's credentials going forward as Wagner hinted at in his press conference um, it's so much more encouraging to see them able to control the game and able to change the pace of it um, like they did in the second half. 
Yeah, well, what, what I'm going to do now, I've got the, the kind of split statistics from the first half and the second half. So I, I understand this probably maybe doesn't make for the easiest listening, but I'm, I'm just going to go through it because I think it it's really interesting and it probably illustrates just how much more control Norwich City were able to to get on the game. So this is, this is the first half statistics now. Uh, in terms of possession, Coventry had 41, Norwich 59%. Uh, attempts on target, Coventry had four, Norwich had three. Attempts off target, Coventry won, uh, Norwich Two goalkeeper saves, uh, again, Coventry one, Norwich two. Total passes, 176 for Coventry, 253 for Norwich. And in terms of completed passes, uh, Coventry one, two, three, Norwich two, oh, three. So that was the first half. You then compare it with uh, with the second half. And, and I think this shows how much more control Norwich City had over this, over this fixture. Possession, Coventry 32%, Norwich 68%. Attempts on target, Coventry had zero, Norwich had four. Attempts off target, Coventry had three, Norwich had five. Uh, goalkeeper saves, Ben Wilson made three, Tim Krull didn't make any. Total passes, uh, one, three, six for Coventry, three, three, uh, three, five, five for Norwich, sorry. Completed passes, 99 Coventry, 316 for Norwich. I mean, that's, 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 complete and utter dominance pad in the second half and in many ways as we as kind of we me as well, Sam said and, and I said there that is a level of control that Norwich City haven't been able to put on a fixture certainly within a game to change it and to assume and wrestle control and actually have the confidence and structure to grab it and control it and manage it is something we've not seen from this Norwich City team all season. Yeah I mean and part of that is is Coventry facilitated that and not in a in a in a willing way but just because robin's alluded to it that they had quite a lot of inexperienced players in some certain key areas of the pitch and and that almost being put on the carousel to to use that terminology if you look at the difference in in pass completion and passes attempted that the, the tank just emptied i think as that second half elapsed you can imagine if you're one of coventry's front players or attacking midfielders and you're you're leading the press and and they just couldn't get near and and as the as that half wore on, that became more and more marked, and the chances flowed. And as you say, was it four on target, five off target? You know that was that's quite a sustained barrage in and around the Coventry goal. So, but then the flip of that is that Norwich have to be good at retaining the possession to 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 tire out a uh, Coventry. I mean, ultimately, uh, I'm going to give him a, a name check now. My good mate of mine, uh, Rich, who's a avid consumer of the content. Um, even though he's a Coventry fan like me, but uh, he he was at Burnley. They played Burnley the week before, uh, lost one nil. Very late goal, not that different in terms of how it played out. When Norwich went there, actually losing one nil late on. Uh, and Cov also played Sheffield United recently, uh, and those two, as it stands, look like they're they're almost uh, Premier League bound already. Um, he watched that game yesterday. He thinks Norwich are the best team in the Championship, and uh, and and he's a very astute judge. So that tells you maybe what hasn't happened up to this point and and that's a frustration because there's an independent observer who's seen all three teams at close quarters very recently and he's in no doubt Coventry, uh, Norwich are of the three the best team in the division so that a lot of that is down to Wagner ultimately because I don't think we'd have been saying that if it had been a Dean Smith team at uh, the CBS on Saturday afternoon so it really does show in these two away games. And that's the impressive facet as well. It isn't Car Road, Fortress Car Road with 20 odd thousand fans in your corner. They've gone to two pretty difficult outposts traditionally in the championship uh, and, and have dominated both. Uh, and the margin of the, the goals they've scored and the victories tell you that. But it shows that what we have now is a head coach who had, can implement a system that A, he's got the players who can carry it out, but B, it looks to be very, very residually effective uh, against even the better sides in the division. But of course, next stop after this elongated break now uh, is Burnley at Cairo. We'll get into that, I'm sure, later on. But that is, for me, the benchmark. You know, there's a team who do look like champions elect already. They've lost one league game since August the 13th. Uh, and if Norwich can continue in this vein and perform to this level and get the result against Burnley with a performance, then, you know, you begin to see. The, the pathway opening up for, for Norwich to join Burnley and Sheffield United, albeit by a more circuitous route, i.e. via the playoffs. Yeah, uh, a statistic I didn't mention as well, by the way, uh, XG for all those XG fans out there, of which uh, I know that there are some greater Not than me. others. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Coventry uh, 0.59, Norwich 2.21. So complete do- dominance in terms of that department as well. That's the st- t- statistic as well. Sorry that uh, again some some place uh, extremely a lot of weight on um, more more so than others but also indicates that Norwich City created a, a really good quality of chance as well in in this game, which is a testament to the attacking structure they've been able to create, which probably lends us nicely, really, Sam, to talk about some of those options that, that Norwich City have. And, and I guess it's going to be probably Kieran Dowell again, who takes a lot of the the praise, and rightly so. It's, it's what, three goals and... Uh, and two, one assist, one assist uh, for him in, in, in the last two games, which is a, a staggering turnaround. And it does feel like something more sustained. But you, you mentioned Donnell Hernandez, Josh Sargent and, 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 and even Temu Pukio, I thought was excellent again on Saturday, even though he he, he, he didn't quite um, score the goal. I think his legs had gone by the time he was sent through in the in the second half by Gabby, Sa- uh, Gabby Sara, who also I felt had, had a good game, even if there was a little bit of a dodgy 10 minute spell in there. But we'll, we'll forgive that. Um that attacking setup that Norwich City have now, where the fullbacks push so high, they create overload to the sides. And again, Mark Robbins said it after the game, you've got Norwich players who who kind of drag you in areas you don't want to go and that creates space for someone else. That's one thing. But then maybe what's been lacking at points is that intelligence and that creativity in the final third, that ability to pick those passes out and to locate those spaces when they have become available, which is probably why it feels I end up kind of talking about Kieran Dowell again, because particularly for that second goal, just his, just his calmness, his composure, his intelligence in the final third, it feels like it's added an extra dimension on top of all the other various exciting elements that Norwich City have when they are now trying to attack and attacking in a certain way as well. Yeah, and I think confidence plays a very important role in that, not not only for Dowell, um, but for the rest of for the rest of those attacking players, really, I think the lack of clarity they've had under Dean Smith, obviously the results that they were producing and the atmosphere around the club made it much more difficult to actually probably take that second and just back themselves to play that pass, to actually you know, get, get through two players and to put the perfect weight on it, not to take that second thought and maybe wonder if it was the right time to do it or to overhit it um, in sort of excessive keenness to get it there. Um, and I think Kieran Dow just comes in with a cool head and he doesn't panic when he's in the final third, which is so key when you've got this very frantic system that's based on movements everywhere and everyone's very energetic and probably given the importance of pressing in this system, you've probably just come off a 20 metre run whenever you, re- whenever you receive the ball, you're probably out of breath a little bit. Um, so it just takes somebody with that level of clarity in their thinking and that calmness um, just to pick up, pick up their head and have the confidence to find the right pass when it when it opens itself up. And I think Dowell's patience is another really important factor in that. Um, there are times there were times yesterday when I felt he could have actually forced the issue a little bit more if he had wanted, but he played passes out to Max Aaron's or Dimitris Sinulis or even back to the centre backs at times because he doesn't have that desperation that I think a lot of players. In his position would you know he he's out of contract in the summer he's not necessarily somebody who's guaranteed a starting spot and he has struggled for form throughout his Norwich career really but you don't ever see a time where you think he picks the wrong pass just because he feels now is the time to really force the issue I think he's really patient and as soon as a an opportunity opens up that he feels he can exploit he'll go for it um, but he's not one like perhaps the likes of Josh Sargent and Ono Hernandez have been guilty of before, where he will try and force a little bit too much. I think he's just got that right clarity where he's got the perfect balance and that mentality is is really difficult. And then when you combine that with the technical ability that he's got, as we've said throughout his career, really, um, and throughout his time at Norwich, he should be producing at this level. And it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that he is. In fact, it's a little bit like watching this team produce now. Uh, it's it's almost looking at it going, the right head coach should have got him moving probably quite a lot before he actually has. Um, I mean, we, even in even last summer, we were hearing noises that Dean Smith saw Kieran Dowell as quite a big part of things. But finally, having somebody who can unlock that potential could be a massive thing for Norwich because... With Aaron Ramsey now out of the door, I think the gaping hole since Emi Buendia left is the real 
the real basis of the issue. But, you know, with losing the likes of Aaron Ramsey, Todd Cantwell, um, having Christos Jolis and Milo Rashid mm-hmm. out on loan, they needed to find that creativity from somewhere because Wagner isn't a, a miracle worker. He, he will work, to me, it looks like he'll work very well with the players he's got. And I think he will achieve things with this Norwich group if he's given the time to and the backing to. But he can't simply create, he can't go on the pitch and play through balls and and create chances for those players. If he doesn't have a player to do that, then I, then I, you know, there's nothing he can do about that. And I think if he didn't have Kieran Dow, this Norwich side would perhaps look very different. Um, I think Gabby Sarah would be the, the chief creator, and we saw that he can go off the boil yesterday, and he's still a player getting used to this league. So, yeah, I think Kieran Dow is a, a vitally important cog to this system. But we know he can go off the boil. And I think what uh, an interesting observation for us could be what happens if and when he loses that form. Um, as good a player as he can be, it's difficult to see him having 18 consecutive good games now until the end of the season. And if he does, is it going to be similar to when Emi Buendia got suspended in that 2020-21 campaign or even before that in Farkas' first championship title winning season in the they just go sterile and they don't have an alternative. You'd like to think that Wagner, with with the pro- problem-solving abilities we spoke about before, would be able to find a solution around that. But Dowell is already looking to me like somebody who Norwich are, are really relying on to produce those chances. And I think that's a good thing because he is in their squad and he is a player that will be starting in the future. Um, but I think there is the, the fact that we're questioning, or, well, I'm questioning perhaps where that creativity would come from elsewhere, probably highlights quite how much he stepped up because a few games ago, he wasn't really even in the conversation for the solution to the creative problems. So I'm really pleased for him that he's been, he's been able to step up and I think that's a, a massive positive for Norwich. Yeah, I've, I've written a, a piece on Kieran Dow, which uh, you can read at, at pinkin.com and on the app now about his, his performance. There's, I find him absolutely fascinating because he's, he's, he's 25 years of age, which uh, I think probably means he's now out of the bracket of, of really being able to be described as a young up and coming footballer now. He, he kind of is out of that. Um, whether you would describe him as being completely and utterly in his prime is is probably a different debate altogether. But in his career, he's only made 158 senior appearances. That that 158th came on 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 Saturday against Coventry. To put that in perspective, Max Aarons has uh, has played more games than him. So too as uh, as Jakob Sørensen, who is uh, who's a year younger quite a significant amount uh, more games than him as well. But also uh, that 90 minutes that he played on, on Saturday against Coventry was only the fourth time since he joined Norwich that he's he completed a full game, um, which is uh, an absolutely incredible statistic. And when we talk about inconsistency with Kieran Dow, I think it's, it's probably worth sort of leaning on those statistics a lot because he still really got kind of the, well, hasn't got a huge body of, of, of games at senior level and also he hasn't been really given prolonged opportunities in a sequence of games and a real clear run where he's playing consistently and playing every game um, to, to be able to achieve that. And it feels like actually David Wagner, and this is maybe where I'll bring bring you in, Pad, on, on Kieran Dow. David Wagner, perhaps unlike other coaches who have used his work off the ball or his inconsistency or elements around his game and maybe looked at those as reasons to select players ahead of him or just not to select him at all, David Wagner actually looks to be kind of embracing those with an attitude of, no, I can change this. I can change this player and I can see already what what's there, uh, if we can add to it, and also what sort of player he could he could become for my team. Yeah, well, I mean, to take where Sam left that point there about creativity, I think it's a lot easier to work, and this is no slight to defensively minded players in the game, but to add those elements, i.e. what you do without the ball, then it, then it, than it is the other way around and to try and inject creativity into a player. So if you're working with raw material that, that has the latter, but maybe needs to address the former, um, that's a much easier task from a head coach, his perspective. And, but I broaden it out because it isn't just down. We might, we might get into a separate little discussion on Omar Hernandez, but the reason I mention him now is because what, what Wagner said about him yesterday after the game applies equally to Dow, which, there was a there was a one of the Midlands based journals asked him about Onel Hernandez through the prism of having seen him regularly at Birmingham and basically said at Birmingham he was a frustrating, inconsistent player. He would turn it on one week, he wouldn't the next. 
you could say take Norwich out, uh, take Birmingham out of that, attach the Norwich label, and that is on El Hernandez's career uh, to date. Wagner's response. That's your opinion based on what's gone before. My opinion on these players is based on the here and now. Clean slate. And he said the same about Dal when he came out after the Preston game the previous week. and said he does, it, for him, it isn't about what Kieran Dowler or Ornel Hernandez haven't done in the past or where they were deficient. It's now identifying players and their strengths and maybe being able to address their weaknesses, but then to meld that within what, what Wagner is trying to do and the way he wants to go about the challenge of winning games of championship football. And clearly, given both of those players have started his first two league games, he views them in the current roster as potentially integral elements. And to give them both their due, they're, they're really responding. And, um, you know, where they play on the pitch, inevitably they will get measured in assists and goals. And, you know, that was Hernandez's first goal since the winner against Birmingham in late August. So, you know, that isn't anywhere near a good enough return in terms of productivity. Um, so they need to, both of them need to, to push it on from here. And I mean, you spoke to Arnell after the game and he's in the same contractual situation, i.e. Uh, approaching the final few months of his current Cara Road deal, as is Dal. Maybe there, maybe there's a, a trigger for those players. They know they're playing for their futures. They, it's not just to impress this coach. It's to basically get themselves another contract, be it here or somewhere else. You know, that's got to focus the mind as well. Um, but to give them their due, what's being asked of them, they're delivering right now. And they are integral elements to, you know, what feels like a, a really robust template that Wagner, sorry, Wagner, Wagner is developing um, and moving forward. You know, we um, we might get round to the last few weeks of the January transfer window. I don't see uh, an influx of new blood between now and deadline day in just over sort of eight, nine days time. So, He's going to be relying heavily on these type of players and the other players who are in the building because I think the heavy lifting is going to have to be done by this group. Um, and as a result, you know, both if you're Kieran Dowell and you're on El Hernandez, you can see how the wind's blowing. You can see you've got a head coach who believes in you because he's starting games. And and why wouldn't you want to sort of step up and almost justify that guy's faith that if you're Kieran Dowell, you now have a head coach who really feels you can affect games in a positive fashion, but is asking you to take or add other strings to your bow. Um, and on Dowell, I mean, it was noticeable in that second half, there was one or two t uh, instances where he was actually tracking back towards his own goal and and helping out, you know, to shut down potential commentary breakaways. I'm not sure that's a Kieran Dowell we've seen before in a Norwich shirt. So so he is taking it on board, as, Dan, as David said after the game at Preston. Kieran has been very open-minded and, and is willing to take that and try and incorporate it in his game. And we all know what type of character Arnel Hernandez is. So, you know, for both of those, it's good to see because they're, you know, they're both in the in different ways potentially quite integral to where Norwich's season goes from here, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, actually the kind of aware and we spoke about Dow's awareness and intelligence, but uh, actually, I thought that was encapsulated by well, a the the pass that he made to to send on El Hernandez through, which was a a brilliant, weighted, composed, intelligent pass where it required him to have some degree of awareness because his body shape was kind of pointing right, and and it obviously to go in a different direction. There was also a lovely reverse pass for Puki in the second half after he after he broke through a. Uh, um, Coventry's midfield but actually his goal and, and that kind of willingness to take a couple of extra touches that a lot of other players wouldn't have taken to, ma to kind of manufacture a better chance than maybe the one that, that initially presented itself from what was a very good Sam McCallum cross who and Sam McCallum himself was probably unlucky that he's not going to get too much for mention in this podcast I'm afraid because it was a, a good cameo so we'll, we'll, we'll mention it there I mean um, Sam just, just finally on the footballing aspects of, of Saturday I, I was really intrigued by this game because after a 4-0 victory, lots of euphoria, lots of, dare I even say, giddiness uh, among kind of the Norwich City severe, I'm calling it. Um, among that, uh, among that, there was obviously filled with positivity from last weekend. And, and partly, or part of that from a kind of opposition team's perspective is that maybe there was uh, an, uh, a kind of unknown factor I guess to their performance and how they were going to set up and what they were going to look like and I think we you all have that irrespective of maybe a new head coach walking in and having certain ideas you never know quite how well they're going to translate how quickly they're going to translate or in what form they're going to take sometimes head coaches come in and, and, and move things in a completely different direction to what you're expecting so 
that kind of explains why we saw what we saw in terms of Preston really struggling to get to grips with what Norwich were, were trying to do last weekend. But Mark Robbins and Coventry had a, a whole week of studying footage, of analysing Norwich, of deconstructing what they were trying to do. He even said pre-match and post-match what they were going to try and do and, uh, and the areas that they were going to try and drag his Coventry team into. Does that make this win more impressive, the fact that they were able to do that with such conviction? We've already spoken specifically in the second half, but the fact that this is a second performance and it, it, it was almost, it can become a hangover that second game, particularly after what was a really big win and, and completely different circumstances. But I always go back to that famous Manchester City win a couple of years ago when Norwich beat Manchester City, beat Pep Guardiola's Manchester City and then went to Burnley and got completely destroyed and lost 2-0 and, and it just knocked the, the stuffing out of everyone. That possibility could have happened this weekend if they'd have, if they'd have lost and lost quite badly. So how important a win was this in in all of that context that I've kind of explained there? Yeah, there there are two sides to it for me, really. On the one hand, I think it's it is a major psychological win being able to do that because you look at it in the majority of that performance against Preston, they were winning the game. Um, I mean, you could even look at it as the majority of the game they were winning three 0 I think, and it's not difficult to be up for it and to be buying into the system and to have the positive attitudes required when you're doing that. And then you go to Coventry and all of a sudden it's nil-nil. It's a totally different game. Everything you did against Preston is irrelevant and you have to produce again. And the psychology of that is probably a difficult barrier to get over. And I think you have to commend the players for achieving that. Um, And, you know, I think that bodes well for the future that probably we're not just looking at a 4-0 and a 4-2 and then as soon as they concede a goal, you know, all hell breaks loose and they're not able to produce points from that standpoint. I think um, that it's a positive in that way. What I would say, however, is that I think the Championship is a different beast to the Premier League when it comes to analysis and nuance in tactical systems and coaching and I don't want to take anything away from Mark Robbins or his backroom staff or anything like that. But in the Premier League, you're really talking about football obsessives. You're talking people who work for 12, 14 hours working on the tiniest details to try and give themselves to give themselves 0.3% increased chance of winning games at the weekend. And in the Championship, I think there's more of a... because Especially because of the unrelenting fixture list, there's more of a put, put teams into a bracket. Are they a possession heavy team? Are they a direct team? Are they good or are they bad? And then you sort of apply quite quite general tactical principles to that. I think the way that Robin spoke before the game, he wasn't, and I wouldn't expect him to go into especially minute detail, but before the game, he wasn't talking about counter pressing or fullbacks overlapping or anything like that. He just said basically Norwich are a possession side and they're a good side. And those are the principles I expect most championship teams work off just based on the the smaller budgets and the smaller backroom staff. Uh and the as I said, the unrelenting schedule, I think you find that this was probably just a game where Coventry went into their sort of sit back and defend mode. And not that they sat back and defended, but they're sort of soak up the pressure and counter-attack mode as opposed to a, a more aggressive attacking mode that they might have gone into against one of the, the Championship's more inferior sides. I'm not sure in the prem, in the Championship, sorry, there's as much tactical coaching ability as there is in the Premier League. So as much as, as we talk about that psychology of all the elements they had in that Preston game now being able to be analysed by Coventry, it's not quite beating the best team in the world on television and then facing an incredibly tactically astute squad with probably better players in Burnley the week after the, the elements are in Norwich's favor anyway. And to be honest, they have the squad that even if Coventry set up perfectly tactically, if all Norwich players are at sevens and eights out of tens, they probably should be unpicking that mitigation anyway. So I don't want to take too much away, but in the, in the championship, I think Norwich are a side that no matter how how well the the opposition sets up tactically should be able to unpick these sorts of things in the same way that Norwich set up perfectly to to play against Manchester City but they probably still needed some of those players to have 
fives and sixes out of tens on that day to win that game. And it's the same for me with Norwich facing teams like Coventry and other other sort of mid-table championship sides. So it is a positive from a psychological point of view, from a tactical point of view. Um, I think they, they would be favourites anyway, to be honest. It's it's interesting what a difference player. Well, there, there are a few facets I think which is maybe behind the excitement that a lot of Norwich City fans are feeling at the moment. It's the complete tactical revolution, and it has been the, the push forward to the fullbacks, the new role for Kenny McLean, Gabriel Sara being unlocked in a slightly different way that we're beginning to see now. The the reason that Norwich City spent the money that they have on him, Kieran Dow coming back into the side and and looking very impressive on El Hernandez, who was always discussed as being. Uh, someone who could make an impact off the bench against tiring defenders, uh, defenders, and and um, I think uh, Liam Bramley in, in in past year has even described him as, as as a bit of a finisher, someone who could finish games strongly. Well, that's been completely kind of dismissed under David Wagner. Um, Temu Puki looks re-energised. Josh Sargent in that is playing in a really really clever role at the moment, and and he got a, a goal that I felt he deserved for his work against Preston. Um, he's now on 10 for the season, which means Norwich City have, have two strikers on 10 goals, which is a, a brilliant achievement at this stage of the season. I believe it's only uh, there's one other EFL club who I can't remember off the top of my head who have uh, two two players on 10 goals. So that that is a testament to, to the improvement they've seen. So there's that aspect, the tactical aspect of it. Then there's kind of the motivational aspect, what we're seeing in terms of um, players looking re-energised, um, looking focused looking like they have a belief in what they're doing um, and looking like there's a happiness in, in what they're doing as well and, and a real clarity of that fact. So the man management aspect. Um, and then there's the the connection aspect as well, I suppose. And, and we saw that after the game. And we are going to talk a little bit about uh, about young Amber towards the end and, and that moment of applause and the celebrations after. Um, but all of this feeds into the, the sense of positivity and excitement that people are feeling around Norwich City at, at this moment in time. So uh, we've got a, a few things to rattle through um, before we conclude this pod. And, and we're a little bit pressed for time. So, Pad, very, very quickly, um, Coventry, we, we spoke about it last week. We didn't get to go to the Transport Museum, which I, I can honestly tell you was a real um, personal shame to me because I was... Uh, as everyone who listened to the pod last week could tell, really excited to go and look at all the various types of trains and uh, aviation and uh, whatever else is in there. But um, what I wanted to to, to call, you, call you out on, if that's the real phrase, we had a tweet, and I, uh, my apologies to the person who sent it because I, I can't find it for the life of me now. Maybe one of you guys will, will get it up whilst we're talking, who uh, alerted us to the fact that Coventry have uh, one of the biggest Tesco's in Europe, I want to say, um, and actually, in, to your credit, you did point this out as we were making our way back to the uh, to the car from uh, from from. It's not the Rico Arena anymore, which I want, want to keep calling it the CBS Arena. I mean, I, I can't help but feel you've you've not done your job as spokesperson for Coventry in Norfolk, not to point out the fact that you have such a grand uh, historic element in in your city in that in the size of that Tesco. Other, of course, uh, retail uh, chains are available. Well, I mean, I'm flabbergasted, Connor, that you would put on a pedestal uh, some monument to commercialism and retail above, uh, you know, our, our 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 transport history in this country. I'm, I'm staying. Can I can I just can I just point out on that when you when you mentioned when we were speaking about this uh, after the press conference on Thursday with with other people who were in the room, some of them uh, work for Norwich City, some of them work for other media organisations, and you were talking about the Transport Museum, and then the big te- Tesco's was mentioned. What what was the uh, what was the one that the people in the room got more excited about? Would you say? Well, I mean, that's more an indictment on the people who were in that room, I would suggest. I mean, uh, I, would, I would refer you to Pete Raven, f- father of the Pinkham. Uh, he was very excited, uh, I think, you, which you conveniently overlooked in your dissection of uh, the conversations around the Transport Museum. Uh, so maybe it's a generational thing. Maybe maybe uh, people of a, a younger age range would, would get their kicks from, I don't know, going around the... Uh, uh, the crisp aisle in in Tesco, as as big as it is, as opposed to you know, seeing the jet engines that uh, were pivotal to uh, the outcome of the Second World War. But uh, we'll leave it there. I think we need to move on now. Con- Com- much like Dean Smith, Coventry is now in the past for us. We've played them twice. Uh, it's not gone well from a Coventry perspective, but uh, we'll move on now. And we'll next time we're we're in that part of the world, then we'll have to do. I think you've talked this up to such an extent, you and Harvey. <laughs> I'll use his surname. 
that we're going to probably have to do a record either outside or if I can swing it inside the Transport Museum. <laughs> well, I found the original tweet. It was uh, from at Nodge uh, underscore FIFA story who, uh, who said that these are his words, not my words. Uh, he said the Tesco that is opposite the stadium, the CBS arena. Are you, on a, la- retainer? Are you on a retainer here? Are you expecting to get a consignment of shopping at the Southwell I'm, Towers? I'm just I'm just reading his words. These are not my words. You, you won't like them either. So so uh, here, these are his words. Uh, the Tesco that's opposite the stadium is the largest in Europe, packed with a variety of quality on show. And, and this is the sentence that you won't like. Everything that Kov and the Rico are not. Which is a bit harsh. Well, it's not the Rico, so that's factually incorrect. It's now the CBS <laughs> Arena. Uh, well, he's obviously got an agenda. He probably remembers, I don't know, when Cov rele- effectively relegated Norwich back in the 80s. I don't know how old he is. <laughs> do, uh, do you know, actually, um, my, the- my dad still mentions that as a reason why he's not massively fond of Coventry. So I'm sure there are yeah. Norwich fans who remember that very fondly. Um, but anyway, I've got, I've got something on. significant to add to this discussion in that I actually visited that Tesco while I was, uh, oh, while I was waiting for you yesterday. Excellent. Come on, give us my a review. review. Largest in Europe. I would say normal Tesco, very spread out. It's kind of like you know if when you go into like a um sort of like a posh department store or um clothes shop, and there you sort of go in and it's like a massive shop, and you would think you'd have endless endless items to choose from, but actually you've got about eight different options, and they're all sort of spread out. It was like that, but sort of with crisps. Which was interesting. So, so you're saying they've not utilised the space that they have? No, no. It's a normal, it's normal amounts of Tesco product across an enormous space. That was what I found. That was, uh, but there, there was a Greg's sort of in inside ish. I'm not sure it was actually in, the, but the Tesco is the main um, attraction of the building, and then there's a like a little Greg's, which was actually better than anything you could have got from the Tesco uh, it, personally. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I can add to the discussion very very spacey i'd like i'd like to see it more i'd like to see the space utilized you know if you've got such a fantastic shopping arena you'd want to see the people of coventry serve properly with it you know yeah and, and this is i think ultimately our objective we, we want to see it's coventry boring, spoken boring, out. you're boring me now connor you're boring <laughs> boring. <laughs> we are speaking about coventry in a positive sense um but but sadly mm-hmm. much like their football team it leaves plenty to be desired let's move on then we've got a couple of uh of kind of key notices to get around and a, a, and a couple of uh tweets that people have very kindly sent us this week to uh to read out as well all of which are positive um Paddy, let's let's start with with Todd Campwell because I I don't know if we did speak about him in last week's pod, but he is edging closer. And by the time that some people may well have got round to listen to this podcast, actually, um, especially that five minutes, which actually, uh, if you want to. Uh, compare it to a football equivalent. Felt like the five minutes that Norwich had where Coventry scored two goals yesterday, but we won't dwell on it. Uh, Todd Campwell, Rangers, edging closer. Um, I mean, plenty has been said and, and written and we've spoken about Todd Campbell so much, so I don't want to, I really don't want to speak about it too much, but um, it feels probably like the situation has got to a stage where this was probably the right conclusion. Is, is that fair from your perspective? I think so. And, and in due course, I'm sure Todd will, you know, um, at the right moment for him, he will probably open up just about the whole experience and his time at Norwich and maybe the the latter part of his career. I mean, he kind of touched on that. I think there was an interview, might have been the club programme, I think, last season or earlier this season, actually, now, where he was very open and candid that his career hasn't followed the trajectory I think we all envisaged. If you go back to that first Premier League season when, you know, he's scoring against Chelsea, he's playing in that game against Man City, he looked a real talent. And and as a result, you know, he's getting linked with some very, very big clubs and that's no disrespect to Rangers if, as it would appear, that is his next destination. But, you know, one of the best emerging talents in this country at that stage because he was proving it uh, on a weekly basis in the Premier League against some of the best. Um, But his career has mm, gone nowhere near those type of heights. And, you know, if Dean Smith had stayed here, this outcome would have happened. So David Wagner's obviously inherited a situation which I think the decisions had already been taken by that point. So so it was beyond the point of return in terms of a a revival under David Wagner. Um, But even Daniel Farker, you know, I mean, that's probably the head coach you would think he, uh, when you talk about Todd Cantwell, that he's most synonymous with in terms of the first team because it was Farker who gave him 
that opportunity. It was Farker who believed in him. He was a Daniel Farker type of player. And even Farker couldn't quite extract that regular consistency, um, which isn't a slight on Farker or Todd Cantwell. You know, there's lots of moving parts of this, which I think is why it will be when the dust settles and this is confirmed and we get past it and, you know, maybe in seasons to come when, when he actually sits down and reflects on what happened, you know, we, we'll, we'll probably get a, a better sense of it. But ultimately, it's an unfulfilled talent uh, in a Norwich shirt. And that's sad because he is a Norwich product and it, and he could have been, you know, such a pivot. Or we've spent a large chunk of this podcast talking about Kieran Dow and his influence now on this side. That could have been Todd Cantwell um, because his ability has never been in doubt. It just hasn't worked. Um and it's a sliding doors moment now, and you just wish him the very best. I think in terms of the, the standard, and you have to be a bit careful what you say in terms of Scottish football, but it probably is a, a, a type of football that might suit him now. He's working under a very, very good coach, and Michael Bill, very impressed with, with what he was starting to do with QPR. And when he came to Car Road, how he spoke as well. I could see Todd Campbell responding to him a little bit like Dow, maybe with Wagner. I think he'll find a coach who is on the same wavelength, who believes in him clearly uh, because it sounds like he's been pivotal to enticing him to Glasgow. And you just hope that he finds an environment because they are a massive, massive club um, that he can really re-energise his career. And then who knows, he's still of an age where there's plenty of more chapters left to write. You've seen other players go up to Scotland and, and almost relaunch careers. And, um, and I'm sure you know he'll go there and he'll, he'll probably be in with a good chance of winning silverware for however long he is up there. But um, but I think there'll be always that a tinge of sadness that it hasn't worked and that it ha- he hasn't fulfilled his potential here because there's no doubt, um, you know, there was a player there who could have been the main man for his, for his boyhood club and it, and it hasn't happened. And the reasons for that are many and long and varied. Uh, and responsibility for that is also shared around a lot of people, not just Todd Cantwell himself, but just wish him the best now. Uh, you know, Norwich will get a, a fee for him, but nowhere near what they would have gone if his career had continued on that pathway. And that, again, all flows into the sense of a talent unfulfilled here in, in his home part of the country, but still young enough to come again. But uh, I'll, I think I and many will, will watch his career very closely now and with a fair degree of fascination because, you know, it could go one or two ways now, ultimately, and and that all is going to be down to Todd Cantwell and whether he grasps this opportunity and sees it as a new start um, and something fresh that he can really attack because, uh, you know, probably the last, certainly this season, certainly the season that ended on loan at Bournemouth, you know, he's basically been treading water and, and he's too good a player to be treading water. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of, of small things as well. I think we are going to run out of time to talk about everything that I wanted us to talk about, but we've got a free week next week, so uh, we'll be able to kind of spill it over. A couple of things that I did want to mention, we, we, we got through the whole of last week's podcast without mentioning Barley Mumba's equaliser against uh, a certain Ipswich town, which was um, a brilliant goal, but but also quite funny. Um, the, Ipswich, uh, not that we want to go down that tangent, but now seven points um, off the automatic promotion places which uh, we can all smile at a little bit now that, that Norwich are winning games as well. Uh, Yannick Vildes scored against them yesterday uh, at, at, at Oxford. I'm not laughing at that. I'm laughing at Oxford's tweet um, which they put out uh, saying uh, you know how clubs tweet goal gifts and with a little message at the top they just put Yannick at the disco which is uh, which is a nice 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 spin on it. Uh, a few tweets to run through as well people who have uh, got into contact uh, with us asking we've asked for for questions or any any thoughts of any Norwich City nature, a lot of them positive. So I'll, I'll read for a selection of them. Uh, Paul Krask has just uh, tweeted a, a gif that is all aboard with a man putting on a very shiny purple hat. I can see Paddy wearing that on a, on a Saturday night, maybe. Uh, Ian Gabelli has said that he's already booked his hotel for the playoff final. And I, I have actually just um, verified that. And he's uh, he has, he's, com- he's tweeted um, what is like a confirmation email of a, a Wembley hotel, so that's uh, that's optimism to the extreme. Uh, and then a, a question from Neil Austin around Sarah and Nunez, which we're not going to be able to get to answer today. But Neil, we will answer it in in a podcast next week. Uh, and then Amy, who's asked about the practice match next weekend, which um, David Wagner said Norwich we're going to have with the under twenty threes, and also we'll, we'll probably do a bit more of a transfery pod 
uh, next week as well, given that Norwich City have a free weekend because of that game being postponed. I did want to play uh, two very well play a game of, of yes no very very quickly. Um, so I'm going to ask you quick fire questions, only only yes or no. Well, not yes or no because the second one isn't yes or no, but you, you get the gist of it. So Sam, I'm going to come to you first. Will Norwich City sign anyone before transfer deadline day? Yes or no? Oh, uh, no. Paddy? Yes. Right, it's the same thing, right? But not yes or no this time. Football position. So Paddy doesn't uh, does think they're going to sign. So I'll come to Pad yeah. first. What position do you think they're going to sign someone in? Wide area. Sam, I know you said no, but if you, if they were to bring if I had to, if I had to be a winger as well. Yeah, I think it's a bit, bit boring given Pad said it, but yeah. I mean, there's no... The, the, the hole there is so much bigger than anywhere else, so I think it has to be. Good stuff. Cool. That that rounds it off nicely. I just wanted to end the pod by uh, mentioning Amber Seeley, who uh, had a moment of, of applause yesterday in the eighth minute, wonderfully observed by by Coventry City, who uh, put it on the big screen. They also put it on the on the big screen at the final whistle as well as Norwich City were celebrating with their uh, with their fans. There was a nice moment towards the end where uh, Norwich um, squads kind of came together and uh, and had a shirt. They said Amber's army on it that they then presented to uh, her parents, I believe, and her brother who who were in the away end, um, which was a a really lovely moment. David Wagner actually had a an Amber's army badge on his on his coat throughout the afternoon as well. So it was a a lovely tribute to to her. She was obviously Norwich City's uh, fan of the season last year. It was um, really sad news uh, earlier in the week that she had uh, she had passed away after what what has been a, a pretty tough battle with um, an incurable brain tumour for the last four years and I, I think it's a story that's that's touched all Norwich City fans so that was a a really nice and uh, really nice moment at the uh, the CBS arena on Saturday from from both clubs as well who deserve tremendous credit for the way that they've handled and went about that and also to both fans who um, who responded really uh, really enjoyably as well and of course our, our thoughts and feelings go out to uh, to Amber's friends and family as well. That feels like an apt place to end the pod this week. Thank you very much for listening. Of course, no Norwich City game next weekend. We will try and uh, and fill the void. What I, what I want to do as well is um, is just very, very, very quickly mention the fact that we have uh, we've made a new signing of our own this January. We you, some of you may well know him as um, NCFC underscore Analysis One on Twitter, who's been doing some excellent threads and kind of tactical breakdowns of Norwich City's matches. He'll be doing one on Coventry uh, this weekend. You'll be able to read those in kind of longer form with all of the animations and various aspects that he he does so brilliantly on our website from now on. So that will be up Tuesday at the latest. I'm looking at Paddy for a nod. Hopefully he gives me a nod. He's going to no uh, shaking his head. Well, well, hopefully no, but earlier in that Monday morning, that's what we'll probably... That's why I said at the latest, just to, to latest. give him a bit of a cushion. Yeah. Yeah, okay. so, so so probably Monday, but if not, definitely Tuesday. We'll go with that. But that that gives you a night. They're well worth a read. So uh, so so do read his uh, his brilliant work. I think that's everything that we have to mention. Uh, apart from subscribe to the Pink and Plus app, which of course you can get a free month's trial to as well. That's enough waffling from me. Thank you very much for listening and uh, enduring all the nonsense. We'll see you again next weekend. No Norwich City, but there will be a podcast. Thank you very much for listening. See you soon.